good afternoon, everyone, or good morning if you've joined from Europe, or good evening uh, if you've joined from somewhere else. Uh, my name is Varun Malik. I'm the CEO of a new age consulting firm called Consolidon. Um, Consolidon is new age in the sense that we didn't take the traditional consulting firm model of growing, you know, where you hire a lot of consultants and then staff them on projects. Instead, we partnered with a lot of subject matter experts uh, from across the globe uh, who become our consultants. Uh, they normally work for boutique consulting firms. And at this point, we partner with more than 300 such boutique consulting firms. Um, this model allowed us to scale very quickly. Uh, and uh, by the end of 2019, we'd already delivered about 200 consulting projects across the region. Um, in 2020, we decided that we're going to spend at least 20% of our time on uh, initiatives uh, which uh, are related to giving back our expertise, uh, giving our knowledge uh, from the ecosystem onto, uh, uh, onto small businesses, micro businesses, some larger businesses as well. Um, and in 2021, what we decided was to do a seven day web summit uh, called Connected Insights. So what you're seeing today is a part of day seven of the Connected Insights web summit. We've had about 1,500 people from all across the GCC uh, and many other countries as well join into these webinars and panel discussions to share thoughts and ideas around various different topics. Um, we have a few more panel discussions and webinars left today if you'd like to join any of them. But uh, this particular discussion is being led by Mads Winter, uh, uh, who is my, and I say this in all the discussions where he is, he is my personal marketing and sales uh, mentor. Uh, and I'm really, really looking forward to hearing, uh, hearing this discussion. So uh, without any uh, further ado, uh, Mads, uh, over to you. Thank you, Varun, and thank you for the introduction. And um, I've really been looking forward to this. First of all, it's the last of my events in, as a part of this one. Uh, that means sometimes we're looking forward to an end, but then also looking forward to the next thing to start. And uh, today we're going to discuss about the new world of sales. And that means actually very interesting uh, for me, the new world of sales actually disappeared uh, like four or five years ago when I uh, became a part of, I've been consultant for 25 years, developing salespeople, sales leaders, sales managers. And then suddenly I was so lucky to, uh, to uh, get in touch with a lot of researchers and scientists around the world for sales. And that was brand new because sales has never done any research and scientists uh, haven't worked the same way as in marketing or leadership. But suddenly people, people understood that sales has been under dramatically changed or as leaders, the surrounding around sales has been under dramatically changed. That's why I joined this and really got some perspective to see that Sales is not just sales. Sales is very different from different situations. And this also leads me to when we speak about the new world, we do not speak about the reason for this is COVID-19. COVID-19 is just a big thing that happened. But next year, we will have another COVID-19. And the year after, another COVID-19. But it will probably be named something else. Sales has to understand we were so lucky that COVID-19 forced us to see that something we had to change was changed. One of the things was that before COVID-19, a lot of B2B salesperson didn't understand that you could actually sell by digital meetings, online meetings. They thought they had to go and meet the customer all the time. And I'll show you a couple of very interesting insights from scientists because this shows, these figures are done just before COVID-19 or just around COVID-19. So they are not influenced by COVID-19. They are influenced of the, the changes we've seen in sales. And the first one I wanna share is that out of B2B buyers, 70% of B2B buyers, they want to have a clear understanding of the challenge before engaging with a salesperson. That means they want to research, they want to check web pages, they want to see white papers, they want to run a lot of information before they speak to a salesperson. And the main reason for that is that when we look upon the, the, the definition of trust, 
uh, honestly, B2B buyers, a lot of them don't feel very great trust in, uh, in salespeople. That means they want to have a clear view themselves. Another interesting is that one thing was 70% want to have a clear understanding of the challenge, but 44% of B2B buyers, they say they have, they prefer to have identified a possible solution before engaging with sales. That means nearly half of the people want to have an idea of the solution before they speak to sales. And the reason is they have for many years felt that the power was with the salespeople. They want to win back the power. So we had changed a lot of things in B2B selling. And we definitely see in B2C, it's bigger than that. I could ask Dorsey, uh, which I'll do a little later. And then the last one is, 72% of buyers in B2B, they mostly want to share content by email with salespeople, but salespeople want to take it offline very fast. That means they want to keep a little distance. They want to be negotiating. They want to be in dialogue, but they want also sometimes to stay a little away. I could give you more details about all these percentages and all these research, but it really shows that sales has been under dramatically changed, not due to COVID-19, because this happened for years. And with this word, welcome so much to this panel discussion about the new world of selling. I'm so lucky to have with me Dorse and I have also Rashad. And what we will do now is they will shortly introduce themselves in, 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 in a minute. They will tell a little about themselves and, and how they see these changes and challenges. And then after that, we will invite all of you to discuss with us, bring up comments, bring up questions. You can put it in the chat or you can raise your hand virtually or physically, and we will let you, we'll let you bring your questions and comments and we'll discuss them. I also have prepared a couple of topics we wanna to discuss in case nothing else comes up, but the next 45 to 50 minutes, let's have all discussion about how we handle, not the COVID-19, let's forget about that. That's how it is, but how we handle the new world of selling. And by this, I give the word to you, Dorsey. Please let us hear a little about you and how you see these changes. Thank you so much, Matt and Varun. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really, really excited to be part of the um, um, part of the panel today, and the discussion is very close to my heart because um, I've been in the hospitality industry for um, 14 years. Um, my world is a quite a mix of B2B and a B2C, so I deal with operators and agencies that sell the holidays, and I also have customers directly that book holidays uh, with the hotel directly. So we kind of touch both segments in a different way, and I totally agree with Matt that what I see is not a challenge of the COVID. What, uh, what the situation of COVID showed everyone, how you were prepared for the next generation of sales, how you were ready to take on a challenge because, okay, COVID happened now. But for example, we started as a, as a unit with, along with my team to work on digitalization way in advance. So when the COVID hit, we were ready to switch on the engine of activating the B2C quickly because we could see that the B2B, the agencies with the countries that are locked down, there's no sales coming in internationally. So it wasn't because of COVID, but I know that the challenge for many of hospitality in the particular sector was, they were just not ready for the world of digitalization. So hence they had to close the hotel down and, and figure out how do we, they can reach out to the, uh, the customers that are locally based in the UAE. So um, that's a short, um, challenge that I say and opportunity basically that COVID has, has shown to the sales industry. Thank you so much. And then I pass over the word uh, for an introduction from you, uh, Rajat, uh, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mads. Thank you, Varun. Thank you, everyone, for taking out time to attend this uh, important session. And I really see very active participants uh, eager to you know, engage with us. Uh, my name is Rajat. I have been in Dubai for more than 23 years, and all my life I've been into B2B sales um, in generators, in pumps. So it's all about that industry, uh, I would say mechanical, electrical industry. And uh, for sure, as Mads, Varun, and Dorsai mentioned, uh, 
this was just a catalyst, you know, the, the COVID thing that we have to talk like this, right? Otherwise, you'll be in a hotel. Dursai, maybe you'll get some revenue. We'll be sitting on a nice auditorium and, you know, having the chat. But this is also the efficiency. I would say the most important thing I've got is efficiency out of this virtual thing, right? It was two or two. We started the session and everybody is here, right? We can see each other. We can have that conversation. We have the expression. And I think from a sales perspective, what Matt's identified at some of the challenges, which maybe some of the people feel intimidated by being physically closer to salesperson, maybe they can express, maybe they can off the camera, right? They can still talk, show the specification, but they can talk. So uh, this was my journey. Uh, you can see my background. I'm not in office, but it's, I want to be in office. For last uh, 12 months, I'm at home and I'm currently managing Africa and Middle East business for certain segments of uh, Cummins Power Generation. But at least we are able to sail through. And I would say everybody is adjusting to it, right? The, I, I call it in our industry, the three Cs, the client, the contractor, the consultant. All the three C stakeholders are very well understanding the challenge and they're adapting. So I guess as an ecosystem, we are evolving in sales. And I think we are breaking the barriers to bring the business forward. So Perfect. Short intro for Thank, my you. thank you, Rajat, and thank you, Dorse, and welcome to all of you once again. And please feel free to bring any comments and questions. I like to start because what we have seen, and that's very important, a lot of times sales talk about being customer oriented. Sometimes what I hear is that sales actually is more oriented on their own process to be efficient than really customer oriented. But what I'm going to discuss is the customer journey. The customer journey, whether it's B2C or much more in, uh, sorry, much more in B2C than in B2B, what we have seen is that customers do the journey themselves. That means in old days, if I wanted to go to your Sofitel or the Palm, I would call you. I will never do that today. I will definitely go to one web page, maybe even not your own web page. And if I wanted to speak to comments, I would probably do a lot of the journey myself, investigating projects and project, uh, products, and then interact. This means that we have seen that a lot of the journey customers do themselves. What is the, what do you see as the most important challenge to, to adapt to for sales when, when that journey is so long, they get information about our products, about our competitors, they get all kinds of offers. How do, you, how do you handle this, that the journey has changed so much? So if I may start, uh, Matt, uh, what we have seen, of course, uh, 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 the word of digital, and as you said um, very, very um, correctly, the customers, uh, they, they can go to any platform that is digital and find information about the product you're selling, either a hotel or anything else. However, because the market has been quite saturated and you see many offers, today you Google Sofitel Dubai the Palm, you get many, even not with the website first, you get all different kinds of rates. They're not in parity with one another. Companies that we don't even work with feature us online. But what is so important, I think the challenge is that the, the customer attention and focus bam, has reduced to three seconds. So if the first three seconds you don't grab the attention of the customer, you lose them. If the website, if your platform is complicated, if the customer journey is not friendly, if they have to open three, four boxes, if they have to fill a form. So I think the challenge for today's sales module is how can we design a journey that is friendly, grabs the attention the first three seconds that you have, so that the customers will go to your own platform and you will not dilute revenue because they would go to other platforms and book your book their holiday. So, so what you actually address here, Dorsa, is we need to make it very easy to be a customer. The journey has to be uh, easy. Correct. Easy yeah. and it has to be catchy and it has to make the customer feel that I would like to click on this box and yes. actually see what the offer is. Not yes. that it looks like many other offers that are out there and they're all like in Dubai, advertising staycation. 
So it's saturated. So why would I choose you and not others? Okay. But do you understand that some people in sales can feel that this, this is very difficult to interact in because as you said, we are presented in several pages and some of them with competitors or other, uh, it can be difficult for, for, for a salesman that was used to having a very direct contact to, to people. Correct. So what is happening now and what I constantly tell my team is what we used to know about sales, the booking window, how the customer was choosing the hotel and a holiday was very different. So I had to just go back to the team and say, we need to relearn a lot of other things. Why the customer today want to come? The safety is important for them. And there are certain information that I see today, even if they see it on a website, the salesperson, they want to have that reconfirmation that the safety aspect is, is there. They want to have a reconfirmation that, for example, that the booking that they have is, is, is secured financially. So I think now that the role of salespeople is not just to sell the product, is no. just to make sure that the customer feels that it's a, the backup security that they have with this person to be able to trust what they are investing into or buying. Amazing. Thank you. Rashad, what do you say here? Yeah, so a slightly different industry, yes. but if I start uh, from small pumps or small generators, this is closer to what Dorsai said. Your web interaction should be very friendly because you are going to the consumer directly. If a person wants to buy a small pump for his house or a small generator for his house or establishment, they can go to every navigation and they are able to uh, see through all the spe specification of the product. And we make that user friendly on our websites and even linking it to the new tools of, you know, via order, via Amazon and things like that, which is very user friendly. I think 90% of the people are using those platforms to buy things so they can even buy that. So I think it's more prevalent in our industry and in Europe or America where people buy their pumps or generators. Of course, in Middle East also, it is catching up. So that's on the B2C on the small equipment. Yes. When we go bigger stuff, right? If, it, if, if, if a generator we're talking about 500 kilowatt, one megawatt, two megawatt. Obviously, the name of the game, and you showed the statistics, Matt. Why people, you know, do not interact or what happens to the customer is because most of the salespeople forget, and which is the fundamental, to find the problem statement of the customer and match the solution to the problem. And that's what we call value add as a definition. Now, this is the biggest ask, I would say, in a sales process. Actually finding the problem statement or pain points, you hear different names about it. But if you are not closer to the customer or the market for that particular segment, then you will not understand the challenge. And if you just start bumping the catalog or, oh, we have this range and all that, obviously you make them retrieve because any typical organization, a procurement person can only be a master of couple of items. If I talk about mechanical industry, industry, a person can come from a background of air conditioning, fans, blowers, cables, switch gears, but not generators, not pumps, depending. So if you flood them, hey, this is Cummins, this is, you know, whatever, they will back off. You need to understand what is the challenge? Where are you there using the generator? What are they going to use about it? What is their challenge? So this fundamental remains and this cannot change. This is the first thing which every salesperson has to grow into, whether it is very junior level or very high level of meeting, depending on the class of people you meet, you still need to understand the pain point. So that is A. The second thing is obviously creating that value because they are very much, as you said, knowing the competition. So th you need to know the competition also. In, in our industry, it's very clear that we need to know the competition very well in terms of product differentiation, in terms of where we really benefit, where our product feature give the benefit. So if our efficiency of the engine is good, it will save them in fuel if you run the generator. That's a really important point for customer to know. 
So these are the things which are fundamental, I would say, in any sales process. I actually encapsulate all that. I call it myself as sales excellence journey. You know, it is fundamental. Even you are doing it face to face or online, you have to start from a journey. What I call it initiation, right? If you don't know where you're going, you need to initiate and make the journey by the research. The second step I call identification. You really identify what segment you are trying to narrow down. Then it is the usual quotation process, right? There is an inquiry, there is a quotation negotiation. Then is order fulfillment. Then there is relationship management at the bottom of it. So these are the fundamental team and our teams and fundamentally whoever is working into the business of specifically these bigger products, I would say electromechanical, uh, goes through that journey. Perfect. I like what you're saying, both of you. And then I want to state a couple of interesting things. And then please remember all of you, you are allowed to ask questions, bring comments, and we can discuss it. That'll be great. Uh, but this is very interesting what you're saying, because I'll just give you a couple of examples, a little from your world, uh, Dose, and a little from your world, uh, Rashad. First of all, what we see is that the interaction between sales and buyers has become more and more digital in a certain stage. The reason is that people don't want to be disturbed when salespeople are irrelevant. They want them to be relevant. They want them to be on timing. That means when I need you and I need definitely to be valuable. We see that if you look at, I take first the B2B example. If you look at buying a car in old days, BMW registered plus seven visit in a car shop to buy a car. Today, they visit less than 1.5 in average because you see your car on the internet, you get all information and we make it very easy to buy because you said it, Rashad, we don't need somebody to come and present the product. I want to somebody to present the relevant product, uh, not just the product. So when you look at the, B2, uh, the B2B, we also see that people don't want a salesman to be a walking uh, a product catalog, he must be a walking consultant. And the same, actually, if I want a conference, Dorsey, I need help from you to design the best conference, not to, to tell all about the product. And when, I, when it comes to this, this has to change the way we sell, but it also has to change the habit of salespeople, because a lot of them are used to book meetings, drink coffee, speak with people, Today, they need to be much more prioritizing. How do we change these habits? Because it's not, uh, Russia, you've been in the game for a long time, those say as well. We are, we are filled up with habits, that natural. How do we change the habits? If I, if I have to add from our industry, the, the change happens at all level. And I would put the baton on the leader. Yes. The leader, why? The leader has to concise the vision very clearly that guys, this is our strategy, the vision statement and strategy. We are prioritizing these segments, right? Because this is the market trend. And if the leader effectively communicate that vision, I think that sends the strong signal about first thing first, that this is our strategy. This are our prioritized area. We call it gold tree, right? Many companies use it's gold tree for the year or two year. You have a strategy for three years, but you have a gold tree actionable item for the year, uh, first year or second year. Then I would say something we call one page plan. And it, it just narrows down certain initiatives and it, it becomes very easy for down the road into the sales management chain for people to clearly pick it up and make it their work plan for the, for the year or for the quarter that if I say we want to target this year data center segment. So what are the things we need? What is happening in the data center market in generation in the, in the generator perspective or rental market, for instance. So you, you do that, then you narrow down and then that behavior comes into the research mode. I previously mentioned. So the salespeople are not eager to jump the gun to go straight to a customer with the product, but they understand the market, they understand the pain points of that market, 
and you derive the solution mm-hmm. or you, what I call it upstream influence. You actually become a consultant. You talk to your customer in the way that I want to help you with your problem. I know that you have a challenge for a very critical power in this hospital or a data center, and I want to design the system for you. And then he can take the back end help of technical expert. So I think this is how it will narrow down and change the fundamental behavior of sales walking in uh, for having the coffee without a purpose. Perfect. Dorsey? So basically, um, I think we all used to, in the past, to give a target to our teams on how many sales do they do every month, every quarter. We give them the target and they have to execute. And I think this is what we created the bad habit. I don't think we have bad students. I think also, I agree with Rajat, we have bad teachers. So if we're going to just give targets to our sales team on I expect you to close deals on 5 million, 6 million. They don't know where the numbers come from. They don't know how you build the target for them. And they don't think quality. They just want to close deal. They might annoy 10 customers that might have done three events with you and they don't want to come back because you just always sell something to them. So what we have done as an example, we started creating a qualification form. So this is a form that you will understand the why before you sell the what. So Mm -hmm. people don't care what are you selling. They have to know why are you selling and why should I buy this? So in the qualification form, you make the user journey very easy. Why do you want this? What kind of event do you have? And what are the most important things for you? Instead of just saying, oh, we have a ballroom that can accommodate 2,000 people. We have a coffee break at this price. First, you give a chance to talk less because in the past, always salespeople were known for talking all the time and not even listening. So I think we have to go back and do the the homework the other way around, allow the customer to speak, this is what I want, and you give them what they need to have. Thank you, Dose. Really, really, really great. And I totally agree. The teacher, very often what created the problem is also a part of the solution. Meaning when the teacher created the problem, they are also a part of the solution. So we just need to change behavior. I like that. I will give you a couple of examples because I worked with a group of hotels in Denmark, in Copenhagen. And um, when they, when suddenly the Airbnb hit, they were a little like, wow, what do we do? This is terrible. But actually what they did was they learned to embrace it. And what did they do? They took five of their hotel rooms and made them Airbnb rooms. That meant they actually used the tools. They used the wind to sail instead of saying the opposite. And I think that's what we have to do. How can we use the options coming? And the same when I look at a more different industry like you, Rashad, I work with a, 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 a business to business selling uh, machines of 700,000 euros each. They normally participated also in Dubai. They participated in, in fairs and exhibitions. And that was that was a learned habit that we needed to go to these exhibitions. But it was only five days a year and it cost millions of dirhams to do. And, and a lot of time, and even the salespeople didn't like it. I know they like to come to Dubai, but they didn't really like these days because they were tough and they didn't sell there. What do you do when suddenly you cannot re- uh, travel around? What we did now, we did our own exhibitions. We did virtual product launches. We did workshop for clients and without spending much money, they could do their own exhibitions. So I think what happens when we understand what the tools and the changes can do, we can definitely do something that is uh, much more valuable because now we get relevant for people when they're ready to speak. Now we get we time it because they want and we create that value. So, so how do you embrace uh, the tools and the options and the way to communicate. Tell me a little about how you embrace them, how you use them. Yeah, I think you made a great point, Matt. And uh, uh, as Cummins also, we have gone through that journey now. And as I was mentioning, uh, we have programs called CPD, Certified Professional Development. So we connect with consultants to actually talk about technical solutions. And these are all webinars now, like webinars like this. You know, so we'll present our deck, we will talk them through, and it's very time saving for all of them. They can come for an hour, 
otherwise you know logistic of it we were going to their places or they were coming to our places it was a hell of a half a day or day yes. but now two hours very productive and you are leaving the zoom room and finished so that is one thing one action which has really cemented i myself ran couple of webinars last year for our consultants so that has gone very well talking about the live events definitely uh comments is also creating a lot of platforms to launch our products to create our exhibitions so we virtually create exhibition of our products and uh, based on segments and product classification you can just go there and you know attend those rooms and obviously i i see that the organizers also of big shows are also adapting that and we are partnering with them because obviously their customer base is much wider we used to be in those exhibitions and trade show which you mentioned mats so we are we are making the pick and choose of the ones which are really still relevant and they have gone to the digital platform so we would partner with them uh, because of their reach and uh, we'll try to create as much as the product touch and feel experience although you know it's a tangible big product people would like to come and see but for the time i guess if people become used to it fair enough if if it evolves in a different way maybe after 3 4 years people would like to see the product and maybe we are back in the game and we'll adapt that because we already had that right so yes. i think it's pretty subjective just before you do say i i i think what you're saying rashad is that we we don't go into war with the situation we embrace it and and we start doing exactly what we see is we do much more co-creation much more value creation together bringing as you said the platform is important for you because they have connections okay then we work together uh, because we can do that it's not about the 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 conference room it's about the platform actually and yeah. that changed a lot so so uh, i i would really feel uh, it could be difficult for some of the exhibition centers because uh, they will definitely be under pressure they need to rein reinvent themselves a little so do do say how do you embrace these digital possibilities to to communicate So um basically uh, in in the past we we've, we've always uh, believed that a, a sales person has to do minimum 5 to maybe 6 even 10 uh, sales lists a day and in a week maybe 20 or 30 and i can tell you man that since we are moved to a lot more digitalization and meeting our clients through webinars and product training actually the productivity of my team improved a lot because in the past they would take the car they would go stay in the traffic by the time they reach uh, an office of one of their uh, dmcs or tour operator will be an hour a coffee a tea by the time they get to the business it's it's just the day is gone mm-hmm. so what, what we've noticed that we started introducing a weekly webinars where instead of training one person we could train more than 10 people because let's be honest uh, you can have people like us uh, connecting from all over the world so we've managed to do way more product training if you attend an exhibition how many travel agencies you can meet maybe maximum two or three will fly from different countries but through webinar we managed to do a full product training for the entire office based in germany or based in holland or based in the uk so the productivity improved a lot because the time was used efficiently and i think what we've managed to do is to really introduce the the hybrid meetings because in the past conferences were only happening in a certain setup in the ballroom and we started you know very quickly getting in touch with one of the tech companies to introduce hybrid meetings to be able to have 100 people on the screen so that the companies can have their board meeting and and that was an opportunity where in the past our ballroom capacity could not maybe fit 300 people but yet today we're making events for these many people which we physically could not manage in the capacity that we had so this is an amazing opportunity financially as well for the hotel yeah i heard about a, a hotel in the uk they actually uh, transformed some of the the conference room into studios so people like me could come and send from there you could broadcast your your event meaning that uh, i'm now in the sofitel studio and i'm welcoming all of you so they could not gather people they need them to to change a little i see we have a question here uh munal you want to you want to bring your question yourself you can uh, unmute yourself if you want to please uh 
Hello. Hello. So, yeah, so I was asking, there are some established companies who have already set up their businesses abroad. So when you ask for them to give some leads or when you ask for them to deal with you, they already have set up. They already have leads. So basically, they are just registering in a B2B platforms and marketplace for marketing purpose. And most of, most of them are not looking for any leads. So how, what do you think about this journey or thing? Did you understand the question? I think, can you, can you just clarify a little more? What, what you talk about some established companies that have already set up abroad. How do you think one can deal with them? Is that leads only will look in the B2B marketplace? Please, what, what, what is the problem, uh, Munal? So basically I'm asking is, uh, let's suppose there is some startup and business startups are an essential part of each and every country which are taking place. And there are companies who is 10 or 15 plus years old and who have already established in them uh, in the, uh, established themselves in the market and there are some companies who is less than 10 years old and who is trying to expand so in that case scenario there are situations where only established companies want to work with someone who is as established as them and the startups are not getting any chances in that case scenario so what's your take on it okay i see okay. do you see the point also and russia yeah yes so, so um, maybe i just Touch quickly because sometimes you know um, it, it's very interesting. Your question it comes up as um, uh, in hospitality, as uh, for example, a hotel that has been opened and established in in the in the country for more than ten years. Uh, they start losing market share to actually a new hotel, brand new hotel. So I honestly think um, the way I can I can explain this um, today. If let's say you've been um, driving for 20 years um, and uh, you say I'm a good driver and I've been uh, I've been driving for 20 years but the person who wins the Formula One is maybe 20 years old so it, the, the number of years yes it shows the qualification of the company but that doesn't mean that it will take away a sales chance from a new company because as a new company if you have a high technology where maybe other older companies have not been adapted to. If you have identified a new way of marketing by using social media, which is a new way of reaching out uh, as, as sales to the market, if you have figured out the demographic of uh, who can you cater to as a new business, I'm sure the pie is big enough for everyone to eat, but the question is not, just because they established they're going to make business. No, you can be new, but you can still find your marketplace and, 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 and steal some business and some market share from them. Russia? Yeah, I think, Brunal, I, I understand your challenge. The, see, there are two things. One is a brand. A brand is created by investing into the right things. And you must have heard in marketing, brand is just a product is a dot, but the brand is the whole circle around it. So obviously established company, if they have given the years, they have done something and they are branded, there are certain reasons. But there is no reason to undercut a startup. Uh, I think I agree with Dorsa example very well. If you bring new things, right? We all know the big apples and Google started as a startup garage, right? So there is nothing to do with that. It's all about value creation. In business, it's about value creation. If you are bringing a solution or a value to a customer for his needs, again, it's about need and matching the need and the value creation. If you can bring the two ends meet at the right quality, at the right value, meaning from the business dollar perspective, I guess there is nothing... Yes, getting a chance is a challenge, but then we are getting a lot of social media attention. Uh, people project themselves. I have my friends who have startups and they made it through because of the social breakthrough. So they get first lead through the social breakthrough. They do it well, then it becomes word of mouth and you roll on. I, I hope we give you some inputs of your question. Well, now, you, you want to comment yeah. or? No, yeah, I, it's clear I got your point. So basically, it's all about an experience and how you present yourself as a person, how knowledgeable you are and how innovative your product is. So that's what matters initially for a startup or for some less experienced company. Am I right? Yes. Yes. 
You're surely okay. right. And I think I, I think this is really a point where in some ways it's never been easier than now to make a startup. Of course, it's not easy, but it's never been easier because in old days, if you wanted to promote your product, try to imagine, I, I was in uh, maybe in Denmark, I got a good idea, I made a product. If I wanted to do selling in Dubai, it's going to be very difficult. I had to travel to get a reseller, a dealer, and I had to market myself. It cost a lot of money. Today, with social media and understanding how I can market myself, I can. I know I still have to deliver a service and a product, but I could be communicating to the whole world within a second. And, and that's also one thing I like to discuss a little with you because uh, I, uh, come, uh, Rashad, uh, I, I worked with you, your old uh, company Grunfos. Uh, and, and what we did there was we actually worked a lot with changing the, the social media strategy that instead of just telling about pumps, we talked about pains. We talked about what solutions could change in the company. And what we see is when you really use the social media, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, uh, you can really do a lot of selling. And, and it actually shows that the most successful salespeople, and then hold, hold your chair, please. They spend more than six hours a week on LinkedIn. Please comment a little on that, how you see the social media, Dorsey and Rashad. Let me go at that first. I will give you a clear example. And I don't know the exact numbers, but it is definitely clear that influencers, influencers in the industry are spending considerable time on LinkedIn. So I'll give you an example. 24th March was a data center day. You know, we haven't heard a word data center maybe four years back. Very few people knew about data center as a name also. But now data center is the backbone of or even this communication, because it's going back somewhere, we are clicking everything online. So a data center day, we as Cummins are, are actually promoting it because from there, when people click our data center, then they link their backlink to a Cummins generator or et cetera, which may give us a power of branding and visibility for any potential inquiry or a customer who probably doesn't know us currently, or they are thinking of building a data center in their mind or in a concept. So absolutely, LinkedIn has been a very professional platform for many of us, and it has helped people connecting and then asking questions, people you know, connect and actually share genuine inquiries. If it works offline, it's fine else, you know, but at least it, it is happening. And I think uh, just before you do say, I think what you're saying, Rasha, if, if you contact me by LinkedIn, it's not as formal if you, if you want to book a meeting and show up in my address and we have to spend one hour and a half. Uh, but the, the minute we start communicating, I get to know you. So thank you, Tose. So um, I would like to highlight that maybe six, seven years ago, um, the structure of sales and marketing was director of sales and marketing, maybe director of marketing and PR. And we never had the digital specialist in the team in the past. The PR and marketing person was the one doing everything because it was through newspaper, it was through media. And, and you know, I really think as, as the leaders or as, as entrepreneurs, you need to spend some time to firstly understand what is a social media. And I think, for example, Google Garage offers a very simple free platform to, to understand what is digital because it's also we need to understand there are people that unfortunately do not use LinkedIn correctly. They don't use it as uh, it, it's not a Facebook, it's not a, a, an Instagram. So I think it's very important that everybody understands each channel. What are they good for? What are they used for? And, and really give chance um, to their business. To, to be to be handling that segment by specialists because you cannot we cannot say we know it all uh, somebody is good at sales maybe necessarily not good in digital so it's very important to have someone dedicated in today's sales business dedicated to the digital platform because this really clearly can bring sales can advertise and can bring revenue to the business I think what you're touching is very interesting. We need, we need to understand that the customer, uh, sorry, uh, Monal, please bring, you have another question, then I'll come back. 
Dunal? Yeah, so I had this question about the B2B platform itself. So basically, I'm working on a B2B platform right now. It's under development stage and will be ready in a month time. So basically, what I wanted to ask is, what's one thing if we don't have a buyer or a seller initially in a customer uh, in a platform, what would some business prefer to have as a value proposition in initial stage? What's the call on that? Okay. Did you understand the question, Rasha Dandosa? I think it's fundamental, Mural, that what your company is trying to propose the vision or the purpose, if you do not have a, at least the purpose and the mission and the objective should be very visible on your platform, right? And obviously, when you have those words, and that's where the social media comes in, what are what is your business and what are the critical words you can actually you know, promote them words because people search with those words, right? If they want some service, if, if somebody's in the healthcare services or home care services, they will search home care provider. So if your vision is saying we provide the best home care services, example, then home care will pop up and they will bring it to your platform. So this is just an example. If you are in another business, those common words should be part of your vision or a brand. Those are Oh, sorry. Sir, so, uh, Renal, I, I really encourage you to have a look at the Google Garage training. I think that's a free training that you can do. Why? Because it will tell you how to do a geofencing. So when you want as a startup to set up an ad, you need to understand your demographic, the location, the age group of who are you targeting. So if you know how to set your Google ads correctly, as Rajat said, if you know what you're offering, what is your unique selling point, who, who are your demographics, who are you targeting, the digital can do the magic. You don't have to, and today we have an opportunity to let the algorithm help us. So if we set them up correctly, they will find within the demographic of your business the people that would be opening your ad and would be interested in what you what you do having. So oh, very true. I got your point. But what my actual question is: What's the value proposition which I can provide at initial stage for them to treat in? Let's suppose you are you are visiting a B two B platform, and you are you want to look for buyer, right? No, initially I, we don't have a buyer. As we are a startup. So what's the value proposition? one should provide but initially for you as a business to retain in the platform and give us some opportunity to find a buyer for you in that case, scenario, what's the value proposition we should provide initially? So um, I'm not sure, Murnal, what kind of a business are you in? So basically it's a B2B platform, unlike a marketplace, it's like you are aware of Alibaba and all. So it's the same yes. as them, but it's different as it's not an e-commerce. It does not provide e-commerce. It's an uh, B2B platform, but it does for globally and it's for domestic as well. So we are covering both the experts for every country as well as international as well as domestic. So we have our own USPs and we are standardizing the process. We are customizing the process. We are learning from what uh, people, manufacturers are facing problems as per our survey. So we're improving on that part, we are trying to add a uh, conversations for events on our platform as well as uh, video conferencing done. So basically, get to when you we are trying to what's our purpose is to bring more business to a company. That's the our basic purpose. And uh, I was trying yeah. trying to uh, get the more customers, but at the same time, I was wondering how do I retain them on the platform initially until we have a buyer figured out for that industry or niche. Uh, do you advertise at the moment on any platform, or you do not advertise at all? So we are in the development stage and we'll be ready in a okay. month. Okay, so honestly, my honest uh, suggestion to you is to really, you cannot expect people in today's um, uh, uh, digitalized world that they, they are flooded with information to find you. You have to find them. So what needs to happen is you have to clearly identify, um, as Rajat mentioned, your key selling points. Why would people come to you? Basically the why. And, and really uh, put an, an, an online on Google ad, at least for people to be able to, as Rajat mentioned, to, to Google the word, let's say uh, Alibaba, you can see, you can search and you can click on it. 
So it, it's really important that you, you do need a bit of an investment in terms of advertising online, at least the, the SEO, um, because SEO and SEM is very, very important, especially for the startup business to be able to be on top of the search when people are searching for, for your product. So I really, I really suggest that you need to look at how would you want to set up an online advertising for your company. I think uh, I, I worked with uh, somebody who do, did something similar to what you're talking about, Ronald. I don't know exactly what you're doing. One of the problems I see is uh, if you want it to be too generic or too broad, uh, it's going to be troubleful because then Rashad can marketing uh, some of his pumps. I can marketing my consultancy. Uh, Dorsey can marketing her conference room. And then I think you might not hit us in the right way because then you're too broad. Maybe you should be more specialist in an industry or a segment. And then you definitely need to show those who, who want to promote the product, you need to show that you have clients interested. And secondly, I think what you need to understand is if you go in the broad perspective, you're going to compete with something like Amazon. And Amazon business is a brand already. That means you must really think, because I, I think, um, uh, Dorsey, uh, you would you would prefer to, to, to use uh, Booking.com or uh, Expedia than just something generic, right? Correct. So, yes. so that, that, is, that is the that, first way that people would like to book first, yeah, because they know the brand, they know the name. Sure. And Nevin, you have a question. Sorry for a little waiting time. We are, uh, you have one question for us. Hello. Hi, Matt, uh, Raja and Dosai, and everyone attending. My name is Nevin Lewis. I'm a headhunter and CEO at Black & Gray HR. I specialize in identifying top performing sales and marketing professionals for some of the leading businesses in the Middle East. Um, most of the top performing sales professionals I've placed over the years, listen to learn, and they are memorable, unique, uh, confident when they meet their customers face to face. Uh, now there is a transformation happening. Uh, I have just one question for the panelist. What are the top three traits you would look for when hiring B2B digital ready sales and marketing professionals? So I'll just repeat the question. The top three traits no, that you'd okay. be looking for. Dorsey or Rashad, you want to start? Yeah, Dorsey, if you want to, otherwise I can go. You start, Rashad. Yeah, yeah, Nevin. No, good one, actually. And you did highlight some of them. And if I have to go personally selecting, I think it's the most important thing uh, from the profile perspective is about uh, the, the understanding of the sales cycles, right? Most of the people are completely, you know, they just come and they talk, but they don't understand even a simple sales cycle. So understanding of sales cycle, obviously personalities are different. We, we can gauge them in different ways, right? But sales cycle understanding, um, the, the depth of knowing about listening power, and uh, I think that happens when you really have the conversation going that the person is actually understanding your question and determining the answer in that full totality. And then obviously, depending on this industry, there are many nuances, but I think a couple of these things, we can always add up about leadership and all those you know, important things. But if, if I ask a question, even a simple question, I'll tell you on a sales, I, I ask people, what is CAGR, right? C-A-G-R. And if a salesperson cannot answer me a full form of CAGR, it's, it's kind of dead in the water because people, you know, if you're not in the sales cycle, you will industry, I would say, or in any industry, which is B2B. So maybe I didn't give you the three words, but it's, it's about, you know, within the sales cycle, if you're really looking for a dynamic person, I would say knowing the sales process, listening ability, and obviously the personality in coming the other skills. Thanks. Dose? Hi, Nevin. So um, what the three things I look really when I interview people, one is the, the sense of entrepreneurship. They are people that by nature, because you want to hire people that they take this business as their own business. 
So they don't think I'm going to go to the shop, clock out at 6 p.m. and that's the job done. So I always, you know, test that to see if they really take it as if it's their own business. It's, you don't Sounds work for me, this, this is your Absolutely. own business. And number two is in today's um, world, it's mm -hmm. important to, uh, to understand that the salespeople need to be active on digital. So I go look at their profile on LinkedIn. How, how often do they post? What is their voice as a salesperson? Um, how interactive are they in different professional platforms that are happening in, in, the, in, the, in the UAE or in, in any country? Are, are they part of the hotelier community? Are they part of any association that is linked with, for example, what Matt and Barun are putting together? Are they attending any panel discussions? So that shows you a lot. So that's the second one. And the third one is um, we always in the past used to hire salespeople because the personality and they know how to sell. But we forget that today we need salespeople that have a bit of understanding on revenue. So part of my interview process is a bit of a question of um, a little small question of quiz of how the understanding of revenue is, profitability, ENL. It's important because you don't want just people that are robotic and don't, don't understand where the numbers come from. So I always tell the team, I want to hire people that are smarter than me. Because if I'm not uh, able to attend the meeting and you have to go to a business review, you need to know what is PNL. You need to know how you uh, you calculate certain numbers. So I think it's just not the sales skills. It's a bit more of a 360 of understanding what revenue is, what profitability is, and how the numbers are put together. I would like uh, to come on, Nevin, as well, because uh, I just worked with a company from, from Norway, and they are selling... Uh, B2B, but it's to uh, retail. And they uh, they hired a guy who was coming from a very big brand and he used to be having extremely well, uh, fantastic results. But when mm -hmm. he came to this small company, he was used to having a big brand and not entrepreneurship. And he was a failure, but he was very successful because the, the, the headhunter focused so much on results and he didn't focus on one important thing. What kind of culture and environment is this guy coming into? And that would this be is the one. most important thing to understand. What will he, how will he fit into this? Then secondly, what we see is a change in sales now. Normally when, when you did your job years ago, uh, you looked for extrovert person. Today, you're still looking for extrovert, but a little less. They might, they might be a little more introvert, reflecting, understanding, not so like, wow, I'm the world's best man. The salespeople in old days was a promoter. Today, they are also need to be a little more analytic, a little more understanding. Does, does it make sense? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So, so still, of course, they can be social and, and, and engaged, but they could be a little more rational, a little more uh, introvert, and, and then, the third thing you need to, 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 in your business, it's, am I right? Search and selection is pretty competitional. Correct. Yes. It yes. Is. You need to change because I'm not, I'm not buying your product. I'm buying your advice. And the advice is to challenge. If I was looking for a salesman, I said, I need somebody who can do canvas and who can be extrovert. Then need, you need to challenge me and say, is that the right person in your business? Is that the right person in your environment? Are you sure he will fit for the future? Or are you looking for somebody who was like you in the past? Sounds great. Uh, yeah, I hope it got uh, make a little sense for you. Absolutely. I think uh, you've made what is valuable important. Um, yes, I agree with all three of you. I think a cultural fit is something that I usually look for. Yeah. Uh, Introverts, yes, in the future, uh, definitely going to be a focus because yeah. I'm an introvert. Uh, I understand the science and the art of talent acquisition. Uh, there is a component of sales. Uh, um, I think I'm also digitally active. So I understand that, yes, you need to have a presence online. So thanks a lot for the- uh, And I think you just, show, you just Please. showed what Rashad, he said, uh, you need to be a good listener and a lot of, a lot of extrovert, very highly engaged salespeople, they don't listen. They think they do, but they don't listen. 
Uh, they hear what you're trying saying, too hard to impress, I guess. Sorry, <laughs> they're trying too hard to impress. So exactly, the tendency we, with a lot of sales guys. Yeah, so we are about to close very soon. I will now give the word shortly to Dorse and, and then Rashad. And what I will ask you to do is I'll ask you just shortly to give uh, the best advice you could give to somebody who wants to su succeed in the future in sales. What is the best uh, advice to them? Dorse, would you uh, please uh, start? Yes, sure. So um, I think the best advice I can give is to be the best salesperson or a sales leader or a sales director is not about what you sell, is how you sell it and why are you selling it and why people need to buy your product. So it's not just about I'm giving you this, it's to understand why the customer has to choose you. So we, we, we are not the one choosing the customer, the customers are choosing us. So I think that's the key and to make sure that we really build a team with the culture of entrepreneurship, the team that feels empowered, the team that feel are allowed to be innovative and think out of the box and, and allow them to be who they are, of course, within the territory of what the company says but to allow them to come up with ideas that might, we might not have thought about. So I think that's, um, that's my piece of advice. Thank you. Russia. Yeah, I, I would start with the word excellence and even ruler of Dubai and designer Sheikh Mohammed says, there's no finish line in excellence. So I, th that is the most important thing. And then excellence with sales excellence, as I mentioned early on, understand the sales excellence. See every sales happens with a certain cycle, certain circle. If you understand that, pay attention about the customer need as many of time it has been repeated. If you understand the customer challenge, it will be very easy to fit the solution. So it's about challenge and solution, need and fitting the solution. If you remember that and actually go through the process of the excellence of sales, you will more or less be successful. It's not about the transaction you will make it, but you will actually impact the customer for your future. And that's how you build relationship management, right? We didn't do relationship management in, in, in sales, but that's very key important. Key account management, relationship management. You hear so many words, business development. How does that all happen? You need to connect, right? And how do you connect with somebody? Even if it's your cousins or friends, you actually give them some delight. You, you delight them with something, right? You take away the pain. So remember that, that's how the business is. Thank you. I think that was very interesting because I think we need to understand, we talk a lot about sales, but what we actually need to speak about is how people buy. And I think we need to change that perspective in selling. We teach them uh, revenue and targets and uh, now we need them to delight people. If you go to Dubai Mall, uh, you don't want anybody to sell to you, but you want to buy a lot. And we need to change that perspective also in B2B selling. And then I would like to thank you, Dorsey. Thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure. Russia, the same to you. Thank you so much. And to all of you, thank you so much. And I think, uh, Nevin, you inspired me to this. It, it is not about impressing. It's about inspiring people. We don't need to impress. We should inspire. And with these words, Thank you so much to all of you. A little sorry for going a little over time, but I really hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much and take care. Thank See you, you soon, hopefully. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Matt. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Matt. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you to all of you.